Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, an extraordinary fossil find that may change the timeline of human development. And we'll hear about a new recording by the Phoenix Corral. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Arizona's seasonally adjusted jobless rate for January remained at 6.6 percent. The State Department of Administration says Arizona lost 43,000 jobs in the first month of the year as employers let people go following the holidays. Now, eight of Arizona's 11 employment sectors lost jobs in January, two sectors gained jobs, and one remained flat. The earliest known fossil of the human genus was recently discovered by an ASU team in Ethiopia. The fossil consists of a lower jaw with five teeth, and it dates back 2.8 million years. For more on the discovery, we welcome William Kimball, director of ASU's Institute of Human Origins, and Chilacho Seyum, an ASU graduate student from Ethiopia who actually found the fossil. Good to have you both here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Uh, Bill, <laughs> what actually was discovered and where? The, uh, the fossil discovery our team made is that of a lower jaw of a human ancestor containing about half a dozen teeth and it dates to about 2.8 million years ago, recovered from a, uh, a very rich place called Lady Gararu in the northern part of the Ethiopian Rift Valley. And this is an area where teams have been searching for many years and have made a number of remarkable discoveries, and this is the latest among them. Why, why are discoveries made there? Why was this targeted and not down the street somewhere? The Ethiopian Rift Valley is one of the richest uh, sources of human fossils in the world, bearing on the very earliest emergence of humans from an ape-like ancestor millions of years ago. Um, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, many East African countries have contributed important fossil finds from the Rift Valley because these ancient sediments are actually exposed at the surface today, and erosion brings these bones out onto the modern surface for us to find. And you found this jaw with five or six some odd teeth. First of all, uh, tell us what you were looking for when you found this. Oh, yeah, that morning uh, we were serving the Leidoita locality, and uh, I just walked to one of the hill. Uh, it is uh, a sediment, and uh, I was looking for fossils. Uh, actually, we were looking for potential hominids by that morning, and uh, the one of the tooth was popping out from the yeah. sediment and just caught my eyes. Well, I was like yeah. walking, and I sat down and looked at very closely, and uh, it is uh, it was a tooth. So just when I pick it, it's a mandible. A piece of mandible. Yeah, a piece of jaw. Now, when you picked it out, did you think, okay, this is this might be older than three million or younger than two million? Did you realize exactly what you got? Oh, I know. The first thing I, I knew was it was a hominid, you know, ancient uh, human jaw, and uh, we know we were targeting particular time period between 2.5 and 2.8 million years old. So we know it's not older than 2.8 million and it would be between 2.8 and 2.5 million years old. So uh, we know where we were looking for. Yeah, okay. And again, there's that jawbone, there are the teeth, and the idea that it had to be, or you were looking for something uh, between 2.5 and 3 million. Talk to us right. about Lucy, which is 3 right. million, and how, why it's so important that you found this. The African fossil record gives very powerful testimony to our emergence from an ape-like ancestor. We see in the fossil record first with uh, uh, the emergence of two-legged walking, bipedalism, uh, by around four and a half million years. By three million years ago, we see that perfected in Lucy, for example, uh, also uh, a, a creature called Australopithecus. And by two million or so, we see the emergence of larger brains and sophisticated stone tool technology coming into the record. So a very nice fossil record, but it's not complete. 
And one of the, the, the gaps that we've been confronted with is the period between around two and a half and three million, which bits of fossil evidence has indicated would be the time when our lineage, our genus Homo, the one to which our own species, Homo sapiens, belongs, would have emerged. And so because that's a, a particularly uh, poorly represented area, any fossil is bound to have a major impact. And, and this jaw dated to 2.8 million years exa does exactly that. But, and again, you were focused, you were looking for this, but how do you know that that area would have something in this 500,000 to 700,000 some odd year? I mean, how do you know to look there? Oh, <coughs> uh, this has uh, a number of uh, disciplines, you know, so we have geologists, archeologists, paleontologists, paleo, environment and hominin specialists. So the geologists dated that sediment and they already gave us this uh, estimated uh, edge of that particular site. So the geologist knows, you know, the date. So yeah. we know the time period. And there you are. And again, when you saw this, you look happy there, but did you really know exactly what you had? Were you pretty sure this was I don't want to call it the missing link, but you know what I mean? This transitional kind of fossil? Oh, yeah, you know, uh, I knew. You, yeah. know, you, you can see from my smile. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I was very excited, you know, uh, because uh, like every scientist, when they go out for field, they have questions, they have hypotheses. So in our project, the question was to find hominid at that time period. So when we found that fossil, I know it is going to be very important given it is time period. So I was very excited. What were your thoughts when this was discovered? Well, I saw it a, a, a little while later uh, in Addis Ababa at the National Museum of Ethiopia where it's, where it's curated. And one of the things that first struck me when I saw it was how different it was from the ancestral Lucy type of, of human ancestor Australopithecus. Okay, real quickly, why is it different? How is it different? We can see um, in the shape of the teeth and in the architecture of the jaw itself, the fossil record shows the emergence of a modern human form over millions of years. And it moves from ape-like or more primitive to more advanced, more human-like. And, and this, this jaw sits at, at a time period of 2.8 million, shows very early traces of the emergence of human-like characteristics in the jaw and teeth the shape and architecture of this part of the skull. What is driving these changes? Well, sensibly, um, we would think there's something about the diet uh, that is probably changing in human evolution between a Lucy-like creature and, and our own lineage. What those changes were in detail, we don't know yet. That's the subject of continued uh, thinking and analysis, but it most likely had something to do with what these creatures were eating. Interesting. Now, you are Ethiopian, correct? Yep. And this was discovered in Ethiopia. Had to be pretty exciting for you. It is. Yeah. It's very exciting, you know, for a number of reasons. So this will, you know, confirm that Ethiopia and other East African countries are uh, the place where human being began. And uh, this is very especially this uh, um, jaw, uh, which belongs to the genus we, which we are also, uh, is the uh, beginning of the human being. So it's very interesting. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's very good for Ethiopia uh, to be represented by this jaw in addition to the previous discoveries. Yeah. So again, what do we learn now from this discovery? Discoveries in this particular period of geological time between two and a half and three have been um, very, very poor in quality and few in number. What this helps us do is it helps us link the ancestral line of Australopithecus, Lucy, mm -hmm. to us by providing a link, if you want, we don't like the term missing link, but, but, uh, but a link in time between an ancestor and a descendant, us. It helps narrow the window in which our team and other teams working in Ethiopia and elsewhere in East Africa should now begin to look for even earlier traces of our lineage that will help firmly tie it back to something like Lucy. Indeed, and my last question for you is, that's what we learned. What questions now are raised? Yeah. 
This is, a, this is the question we always ask ourselves. What are the next questions? We want to know what is driving the changes in the, draw, the jaws and teeth. So diet, as I mentioned before, is one area where we need to start thinking about uh, questions that would have been responsible for the, for the deviation of our line from that of Lucy in terms of dietary behavior. Um, we usually associate the genus Homo, to which our own species belongs again, with you know, big brains and sophisticated culture, uh, technology, but we don't know as we sit here whether those changes emerged at the same time as the changes in the teeth and jaws. Interesting. Don't have that record yet. So we'll be looking, as other teams will, uh, in this now narrowed period of time for uh, any uh, clues as to the emergence of other human characteristics that we see in ourselves as unique. Well, uh, congratulations to both of you. Great find out there, by the way. Thank Good you. work on your part. Uh, <laughs> congratulations to both of you and you so continued much. success. Thanks so Thank much. You. Tonight's edition of Arizona Artbeat looks at the Grammy Award winning Phoenix Chorale. The Phoenix Chorale's latest album is titled All Night Vigil. It's a collaboration with the Kansas City Chorale, and the recording will be released by way of a worldwide interactive listening party. Here now to talk about all this is Jen Rogers of the Phoenix Chorale and one of the group's singers, Toby Kidd. Good to have you both here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Let's find what exactly is the Phoenix Chorale? Well, the Phoenix Chorale is a professional a cappella choir. It's been around since 1958, um, and it's 28 singers. It's all professional, but it's not full time. They all have day jobs, um, but many of them have uh, at least a minimum of a bachelor's degree um, to a master's degree to a doctorate, PhD in um, vocal or um, conducting. And uh, two Grammys, eight nominations. I mean, this is pretty impressive. Yeah, we're really proud of what we've been able to accomplish. So. And as far as the all night vigil now, talk to us about this. What is this piece about? Who composed it and why did you choose it? Well, uh, the work was chosen by the artistic director, um, Charles Bruffy. And um, our release is actually commemorating the 100 year anniversary of the world premiere in uh, 1915. So um, it's kind of, a, kind of a nice milestone for us to be able to release it on time with that anniversary. Um, it was composed by Sergei Rachmaninoff, and uh, it, it uses a, a high church Russian uh, Slavonic um, as, the, as the language. Very interesting. And again, is this the kind of thing that, uh, is it, uh, Rachmaninoff, I know for pianists can be really yes. difficult. Is it the same kind of thing for singers? Yeah, I would say so. It's, it's, a, it's a very challenging work to, to sing, to learn, and, uh, and to perform, um, especially once we've gotten our the artistic touch on top of it, it becomes quite, uh, quite an undertaking. I'll bet. And as far, and again, 100 year anniversary might be a nice uh, reason to perform it. Why take the extra step to record? And how does the, the chorale take a step to say, this is something we really want to put down on record? 
Well, this is really one of the great choral works. Um, and we've, we've had this body of um, albums that we've released over the last decade um, with our label, Shandos. And um, it was something that our artistic director, Charles Bruffy, he really, he really kind of struggled with what the, what the next project was going to be. And this was such a, a, a seminal work, um, something that his uh, mentors had recorded. And it was something that was really special um, to him. And so he, I think we all kind of felt like it was time for us to put our stamp on it. Is there ever a time when the chorale says, we're gonna record X, and you record X or you start rehearsing X and it just ain't happening. No. Never happened. No, huh? it's all, all, everything is very intentional and we always will, uh, we often will actually program our, the next recording project as a concert. And so part of, the, I think, the magic of this recording is that we just had come out of, re, of performances over a couple of weekends. Then we go right into the, well, studio, into a church. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Into a cathedral and, and record it. And again, for you, it's singing these things as part of, of the choir at the chorale, um, do th I mean, are times it's, it's really clicking and other times you're going, I don't know if we're going to make this or not. <laughs> uh, sometimes, yeah, you, you do have that moment where uh, you might feel a little un unsure of yourself. Um, I think that's the beauty of being able to perform with others. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes when you feel yourself not quite being on point, uh, somebody else is backing you up. And you teamed now with the Kansas City Chorale for this recording. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to us about that. How was that? Uh, it was brilliant, actually. Uh, it was a great opportunity to sing with them because they're with the same artistic director. Um, a lot of us had the same feeling that it was like getting to sing with, you know, a long lost choir you didn't know uh -huh. was there. You know, for me especially, it was my first time pairing up with, with the KC Chorale. But, uh, the way things came together so quickly and so easily was really, really rewarding and a lot of fun. Why, what, what, why would you team up with another chorale? Is there a, a reason for that other than the artistic director has a, has a relationship? I mean, I mean, do some pieces just demand more voices? Yes, absolutely. Some pieces demand more voices. Um, and each choir has actually released uh, solo albums. Solo, I mean, they're ensembles, yeah. but solo albums. Um, but there, there are times, I mean, this is actually the fourth uh, recording in our kind of double um, two choir series and it really just it, it Charles is actually the re really the reason that these two ensembles come together um, he rehearses both groups the same way both groups really understand his hand I mean he's he develops uh, a certain um, relationship with the ensembles and really shapes them and just as Toby was saying I mean they really when they come together I mean they just kind of fit together in this really fantastic it's really magical. I mean, I yeah. remember the first time, the first sounds they made um, earlier last year, and it was just, it's kind of mind-blowing. Wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, you also got a worldwide interactive listening party for the album release. Anyone want to take that on? What are we talking about here? Sure, I can talk about that. Okay. Um, so on, just on this, on Tuesday, uh, we had a worldwide listening event. And, you know, classical artists, well, pop artists have listening parties, and they'll have them online. Um, and in the classical world, it doesn't really happen too much. I mean, you might get together with people in a room and have a listening where you actually, everybody hangs out and has some hors d'oeuvres or something and listens. But what we wanted is we really wanted to create an, a fan experience and we wanted as many people around the world to get to hear this album as possible. And so we teamed up with Classical Minnesota Public Radio's Choral Stream. And our label gave us permission, one-time permission, to stream the entire album for the whole world to hear it. And then uh, we had a hangout afterwards on a Google Hangout and then um, Kansas City singers and our artistic director were in Kansas City and the Phoenix singers and the Phoenix crowd were in Phoenix just down on Roosevelt Row. And then we had uh, our host um, of, who runs the Choral Stream. He was in, actually in Minnesota. In Minnesota. Yeah. Now, did you take part in this? Yes. And how, what, what was it like? Uh, it, was, it was fun. It was pretty interesting to see the big machine start to work and uh, Jen did a pretty great job organizing everything, making sure we had what we need for the event and then to be able to connect and see everything that was happening in the other cities and the interview process. And I thought it was also cool that uh, they had arranged to have some high school singers uh, from the area in uh, Minnesota also mm. be on the stream with us, which I thought was neat to see yeah. the, well, them getting involved. It sounds very high tech. It sounds very modern, very innovative. Is this kind of stuff, I mean, you're, you're in the belly of the beast here. Um, is this what classical needs to expand its audience and to keep going? 
Yes, I think so. Uh, you really do hit it on the head. It's something that you're missing a lot with classical music is the willingness to connect with uh, a modern audience. And by doing things like this, the, the rock party, yeah. as we called it, uh, I think it does a lot to help help reach out to audiences that wouldn't normally hear about us or might otherwise not get a chance to hear about us. Talk about the idea of innovation and looking for new ways to connect. Oh, wow. Um, it's, it's a real challenge. I mean, I think without saying to, you know, to, I don't even, it's tough. Classical music in general, I think what we've seen is that artists will create something and then they let their label go out and promote it. And what we've done is we've really tried to work with our label, work with our distributor Naxos to um, really get ev and empower everyone that's involved with this project to help spread the word. And that's really been one of the things that's been instrumental, I think, is that the artists themselves, all of the singers themselves have been personally invested and that's not something that you always see with with classical artists or even I mean you have pop artists that have they have people for that right so we kind of have to be our own people <laughs> <laughs> well sounds like you're your own people yeah and it's uh, you, congratulations on what sounds like a great success and uh, good luck with the recording and the performance good luck with your career as well thank, thank you, you so much, much for joining us thank you thank you Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists' Roundtable. We'll have the latest on lingering fallout from the budget. And with the budget a done deal, how much longer will the legislative session last? Those stories and more Friday right here on the Journalists' Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.